to infinity and beyond. This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am the father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? And here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the film room. Did you forget about us? Because we almost did. It's Zach Owens and Johnny Sobchak here for another episode at long last. It's been about two months since you last heard from us. So we've got a lot to talk about. But Johnny, first and foremost, how are you? What have you been up to in this time? It's great to, to hear you from you again. Yes, thanks, Zach. It's definitely good to uh, be back inside the film room. And I'm glad that uh, reconnecting with the, the folks listening at home or wherever you are. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been too long, probably. But The good news is we have a lot of good stuff to discuss and uh, not review necessarily, but give our thoughts on and compare. And and it's been a honestly a very promising and I would say fairly strong first half of 2022 when it comes to film. And I mean, not even just film, but like refactoring the stuff we've talked about with TV, you know, with severance and, and uh, you know, a lot of people are into the Disney plus shows and things like that. It's been, it's been a very fun, it's quick, I feel like, first half of the year. I feel like it's kind of flown by. So, I mean, just the last, basically two months since our last <laughs> really... It seems uh, like we, it hasn't been that long since our last podcast, but then you look at the calendar and it has yeah. been quite some time. So That's just, that's just nutty. So um, I'm excited to, to talk and I'm excited. I'm looking forward to uh, discussing everything from the first half and also kind of thinking, looking forward to the second half. It'll be, uh, I mean, this week we're going to be seeing Thor. So uh, that's kind of yeah. starting it off with July and then... Before we know it, I'm sure we'll be talking about award season. So, uh, you, it's it's. I think you're still recovering from all of your predictions of last time. <laughs> that I don't know if you're ready for that yet, but uh, it's been it, it's been like you said. It's crazy that it's already July. Like that, the first half of the year is done. We're gonna talk about our some of our favorites from from this uh, first six months of 2022, and we're gonna break down the the recent releases as well. So we've got a lot to to dive into this episode but you know there's there's been reasons we haven't just been blowing you all off there have been reasons why the podcast has not been happening as anyone knows that uh this is not our full-time job this is our side hustle our 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 fun outside of work on our free time and passion you know, with project. our passion project there you go uh but with with work with life with everything there's just a ton going on and it sometimes it's harder to sit down and carve out you know, we like to go in depth. We have our hour and a half, our two hour podcasts here. So it's been, it's been a, a hard time to schedule. Johnny was on a cruise. I had the, the Ted Lasso interviews that, that we went into on the YouTube channel. That was a, a, the week of Lasso that took up a lot of time to actually do that, record those, edit those, all of that. I had my bachelor party a couple of weeks ago at Bonnaroo. So I was off the grid and camping in Tennessee for a, a weekend that that we could not record or see movies. And then now I'm here. I am 11 days away from getting married. So things are about to get busy. Oh, even boy. more so we're, we're squeezing this one in this week. We're going to try and hit Thor next week. And then like, obviously thrilled to get married, but Nope comes out while I'm on my honeymoon. Johnny, are you going to take that one all by yourself? I don't know what's going to happen here. <laughs> I'll be seeing it open tonight. So I don't know. We'll have to find a movie theater down in Jamaica to go and, uh, and check out as <laughs> Rebecca and I are in the sand and having our honeymoon. But like I said, super busy time, but we're excited to to get back down to business. And it's going to be like Johnny mentioned, it's kind of a general, an open forum, an open discussion today uh, as we kind of look back on the last two months that we've missed out on. I was counting up and I've seen 11 movies since our last podcast since Dr. Strange wow. and the Multiverse of Madness. Um, 
And I'm not going to talk about all of those because there were some def- definite duds in there. But some of the bigger ones, the, the ones that are in the pop culture conversation, we've got, we've got to talk about Elvis. We can talk about Lightyear, the Black Phone, Top Gun Maverick, of course. You know, I don't really want to talk about Jurassic World Dominion, but I figured I would throw that in there. I don't know if you can hear Remy in the background squeaking his toy. He <laughs> loved Jurassic World Dominion, but not going to be full reviews like we're used to. We're not going to be breaking it all down, but instead, like I said, just an open discussion about these movies and everything. And then we're also going to talk through the favorites at the end. So a ton of stuff to dive into, but that's the big like overarching of the last two months. But Johnny, more recently, what's, what's been going on with you? Give the catch, catch the people up on, on what's new with you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it has been, I have also seen, I think, including older films that I've gone back and watched, uh, I'd say around 10 or 11 as well, as far as movies go uh, since our last episode. So yeah, I've been uh, cramming them in. I, I don't think I have been, you know, at least with this year, uh, keeping up with you on the television side necessarily. Severance has been, was my real big uh, mm-hmm. kind of twist there. And also, you know, I talked about the leftovers. Um, but as far as what I have really been keeping up on recently is Irma Vep, which is the, you can debate whether you want folks want to call it a limited series or if they want to call it a movie, a serial cinema. Um, but uh, it's Oliver Assayas, who is a French filmmaker who did an Irma Vep film uh, back in the 90s with Maggie Chung, basically doing a, it's not even a remake, it's like a reimagining is what I would call it, of Irma Vep. And this is starring uh, Alicia uh, Vikander, uh, you know, Oscar winning actor. And uh, she is back in HBO. It's eight parts. Uh, we're basically halfway through. There's been four parts so far. And I uh, just threw it on. I, I knew I was behind. It had already started. And uh, my girlfriend, Reagan, and I wanted to see what it was all about. And we pretty much breezed through those four, four, four pieces. And then we also went back and watched because it's also an HBO Max right now for anyone interested, the original film. Uh, from 1996, I believe. So we had we watched two episodes, watched the film, and then watched the other the last two uh, parts uh, from the new the new uh, HBO Max project. So that was kind of cool, getting a little bit of here and there, of like seeing the pieces that connect and seeing what they're doing different. And it's just a very, it's not for everyone, I would say. I mean, it's it definitely harkens back to like older like French cinema, and also just. It has some really kind of uh, heady, weird meta things going on as far as like the structure and and the themes. And uh, it, it's uh, it kind of helps knowing more like real world stuff with like Asias, for example, like his personal life, like Maggie Chung and, and some other things. But if you're willing to go down the rabbit hole, I think it's absolutely worth watching. I don't think enough people are talking about it, uh, unfortunately. So if you haven't started yet, give it a give it a try. Um, Get, get through the first couple uh, parts and see what you think. And then, uh, you know, keep up with it as it continues to come out. Um, and then as far as, uh, you know, I guess also talking about television, quote unquote, uh, Chernobyl, I just finally, I, I watched the first episode of this, like when it premiered like three years ago, I think it was at this point, um, watched it on HBO at that time. And I, I was totally floored. I really, really loved it. And then I'm not sure what exactly it was. I was just busy or tired. It was too like heavy for me at that time, maybe. Uh, But I did not stick with it. I didn't end up watching the rest of it. So finally, uh, I thought it was a good time to to get back to it. And and last night, I pretty much crushed through after all of our uh, festivities, kind of crushed through all those uh, five episodes. And it was just spectacular. It's so dark. It's so disturbing. And, um, you know, it's based on true events. And uh, it is absolutely worth watching all five hours um fantastic performances writing direction you name it it's got it and uh, one of the best things just on hbo period so if you haven't seen it yet it is only five episodes five hours you can breathe you can do it in a night if you wanted to or in a day um like i did so highly highly recommend and there's a lot you know most people probably know of chernobyl nuclear disaster that kind of thing um you know from pop culture in general but to know the actual facts of it and to know how it happened why it happened who was affected and like still like how, how it affects us today. Super, super interesting. Um, and then on, on the film side of things, I guess, like I said, I mentioned Irma Vep, the original film, and then a couple, a couple interesting things. I, I finally got to see uh, a revisit rather rewatch uh, Avatar from 2009, James Cameron's film. Still on my see- list. 
still on yeah. my list to do that before i would December. say yeah i would say hold out if you can just because i mean it's on disney plus very easy to watch looks good but i would say if you can wait I'm trying to get that first, theatrical yeah yeah your first experience in theaters when they do the remaster re-release like in october september i think it is uh, slated for this year um, i definitely plan on seeing it when it comes out because i rewatched this and you know it has it has you know maybe like a bad rep for whatever reason um if people say it's derivative it's it's you know sam worthington's like not that interesting etc um but i went in just like try to have a, have a clear head open mind and you know maybe i'm a mark for science fiction and and uh you know alien worlds and i'm a big dune fan of course and this this you know this story in avatar takes a lot from dune i think there's a lot of inspiration there uh, but i really was blown away by how much i still really liked and like loved parts of this movie and like liked it overall um it's just an amazing feat of world building and creation and imagination and the characters are you know they're not too like deep they're not so fleshed out but they are they are you know ones that are likable or that you can get behind and, and the villains are villainous and it has it's not anything like re rewriting you know uh the, the the rule book but it's a very fun like engaging like action adventure like fantasy kind of science fiction uh story so i really liked it and i'm looking forward to the sequel of course um, and then the other thing I, I'll just shout out here real quick is I did get um, during there was a sale with Criterion uh, recently, I believe, and I went in and I got the red shoes, uh, which I've been really looking forward to getting for a while and the 4k had come out just in the last I think six or seven months. Um, and I finally took the dive on that got it and had never seen it. So it was a blind buy, um, but it's very uh, revered highly, highly influential film and I Watch the 4K is stunning, like unbe unbelievably beautiful. This is a film from 1948, I believe. Um, and it just looks, you know, it looks like it could have been filmed just in the last couple of decades, really. Um, and it uh, it is beautiful and it has some just exceptional acting. And, and again, the it, it's influential. You can see the influence in, uh, you know, Martin Scorsese's films and Black Swan. I could see like taking influence from it. So um, it, it's just... And try to go in blind if you can if you don't know that much about it i, I would suggest doing that because it's just a very fun kind of story uh and that it takes you on so um that's definitely one of my favorite 4ks or favorite criterions that i have now so i'm looking forward to uh, uh the criterion sale for anyone that's interested just started for july it'll be all month and it's it's 50 off we are not sponsored by criterion Hashtag or, no free ads or by or by barnes and noble but i am a huge criterion advocate and there are so many great films that you can watch on that and the best quality that you can't get like anywhere else. So um, take advantage of it if, while you can, because, you know, the red shoes is just one example of uh, a great film that you can find over there. Well, I did just take advantage of it. So that'll segue into not what I had planned to talk about, but I got to shout it out. Um, I got two movies that have not been delivered yet, but first up got worst person in the world. Um, um, yeah. One of my faves from last year. So I had to pull the trigger there because I currently, I saw it at Film Fest 919 and then I only have the neon screener disc yeah. for it. So I was like, I've got to figure out a way to revisit this without a, a watermark or in better quality. So yeah. picked that one up and then a blind buy, like you were mentioning, I went with Thief, Michael Mann, Ooh, Thief. Because yeah. um, I know you guys, I have not seen, I don't think, let's see, let's pull up the old filmography here. Um, <laughs> I believe there is one movie that I had seen because I was looking at it all. I went to um, Letterbox and pulled up his list and saw the the reviews from you all because I know that Jake always talks about. Um, what he loves he, Thief. He he loves Thief. He loves Manhunter as well. I believe Manhunter. Yeah. Um, but I, I saw like multiple five stars from I think you from Jake from Josh like a lot of high praise and I was like you know what let's let's do it so. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big um big you know just like action thriller mystery fan so I figured yeah. it'd be a, a safe with those reviews and and knowing the the genre I figured it would be a safe purchase here so I went with those excited to revisit one and find a new one to to be a fan of but other than that just a ton you mentioned it off the top a ton of TV for me I have mentioned this multiple times um I think I talked about it closing out last year about how I was shifting more towards a balance. And now that, that is very true this year because I've watched 28 movies, 28, 2022, like new release movies yeah. this year. 
um, which I've been tracking. And then I've watched 27 seasons of television, <laughs> which includes like past seasons. So yeah, I, it's the way that I'm breaking it down is kind of weird, but 22, 2022 shows I've watched 18, but TV as a whole 27 new mm. shows to me this year. Um, so pretty much neck and neck at this halfway point, I've really been watching a lot more TV. Um, some of those being the, some of the, the bigger ones right now being Stranger Things 4, obviously. I know you have still not watched the third season, right? So I, I think I might have started, but no, I didn't really watch it. That's right. Gotcha. So I, I know we don't have to spend too much time on that, but obviously that is the conversation right now as people are diving into and, and finishing up the, the last two episodes here um, over this past weekend. Really enjoyed that show. Um, it was definitely a bit over long. You know, some of the, it was nine episodes, the last two being an hour and a half and two and a half hours. Some of the storylines were a bit bloated or stretched out, but for the most part, still super enjoyable, very fun. Just love the characters there. Um, yeah. So not, not too many complaints from me. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, of course, being another huge one in the, the pop culture world and the, the fandom world. That was middle of the pack for me as far as what I got out of it. You know, it was huge expectations for Ewan McGregor coming back for this character, all of the fans who love Obi-Wan and Anakin and, and seeing it all. Had some really good yeah. moments, had some some filler and not as great moments. So, you know, I, I'm not like, I've gotten to the point where I'm not like ever actively upset about Star Wars stuff. Like it, <laughs> it, it's, it's not worth it. Um, but... I, I liked the moments that I got. I feel like it was, I guess it wasn't like everything that I hoped and dreamed for, but that's fine. I had mm -hmm. plenty of like moments while watching it that I enjoyed enough to like make it feel worthwhile. It didn't feel like a waste or like it was pointless yeah. to actually make this show. So I, 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 particularly in the finale, there was um, some good moments between Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor. So I was a fan overall, but like not didn't blow me away. Um, yeah. But really, Ben, this is funny that you mentioned your Chernobyl story being you watched it, didn't come back to it, and then finally did, because I just did the same thing with Barry um, oh, okay, yeah. on HBO. I had watched the first episode a long time ago, never continued, and then everybody was talking about this third season that just happened, and so Rebecca and I binged, within the last week, we binged all three seasons, because it's really, it's like eight episodes each, 30 minutes, super okay. quick, very, very easy to get through, and it makes yeah. me especially compared to stranger things two and a half hour episodes it, i just like love this quick 30 minute like still <laughs> great great story like feels like an hbo show. it's not like your 23 minute you know like sitcom no. or something um but really really good really good show there all three seasons were fantastic the third season was very solid um hacks season two crushed that that was <laughs> first season first season was one of my favorite shows uh when it came out and now this season was very good as well but was a little upset they they have renewed it for season three but it was in question because hbo this is like an emmy contender you know like yeah. gene smart and um hannah einminder were both nominated and getting a lot of praise like a lot of love in the comedy categories and they this is an eight episode season and they dumped it two episodes per week they like got it out there in four weeks and it was like this is not it just it was very questionable the way that they were handling it of like yeah just rushing something that has a good fan base and is such a contender so that seems strange to me but show was still great it let me watch it quicker but I was very sad when it was done so quick um and then <laughs> currently watching Miss Marvel on Disney plus which I know Jake is a yeah. very big fan of I don't have you been keeping up because I I'm like, it's, it's fine for me. I feel like I may just be like immune at this point to like, to Marvel stuff. And just some of it's very good. And some of it's just like, blah, like, I, I'm not like blown away by this, but I'm not like upset by it. I'm just watching it week in and week out, but right. nothing, nothing crazy to me so far. So I don't know if you're yeah, watching haven't, or not. I haven't been keeping up with that one. Uh, unfortunately, I have heard good, good things about it. Um, you know, Jake, definitely a big, big advocate, but a lot of people just saying that it has like its own style and i think josh uh, as well uh was also getting uh you know pretty interested in it and saying that he was going to stick with it so that that's quite high praise as well especially coming from him 
Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, maybe if it goes all the way to the end and people are like, oh, wow, that was like maybe the best Disney plus like show or best MCU show so far, then I'd be like, okay, let me go back and just watch it all real quick. Just to like hear and see more about that character and see where they're at with that going forward. Um, you know, just to give it a shot and give it, give it a little boost. Um, but it's not, it's not anything specific to Ms. Marvel as to why I'm not watching it or like why I'm not interested. Um, I didn't finish Moon Knight. Um, didn't watch Hawkeye. Can't, can't blame you on that one, brother. Moon Knight was, uh, <laughs> you know, I mentioned those 18 shows that I've watched in 2022 and Moon Knight is holding up the bottom right there. So. Oh, man. Tough, tough show there. But I, I, like, I been, is, that, is that the only two MCU shows so far this year? Mm hmm. They're okay. they're slow on the on the TV front this year to to start off, but I know we've got um uh what what else is coming? She Hulk is this year. She Hulk and, and there's got to be something. I know Andor on the Disney or on the Star Wars side is coming yes. out next. Um, let's see. Pull up the old schedule. Maybe maybe it's just because I know I mean they have several movies still to come, so maybe that's what I'm I'm thinking about, but. Let's see. Okay, uh, here we go. I can't even um, think of the other big. She Hulk is coming out in August 2022. Then we have the Untitled Halloween Special, which is oh, yeah. the is that the Very Michael cool. Michael Giacchino Giacchino yeah. Um, then we have the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. Oh, that'll be fun. So okay. those are the other like okay. Disney Plus yeah, ones. Not so not necessarily yeah. other series, just beyond She Hulk. Yeah. Okay. but we'll see we'll see what happens there but i did i like i definitely i i like the character miss marvel and it definitely has that like you know spider-man homecoming kind yeah. of feel to it and i like the actress that plays here um, iman valani i think is how you say it she's very good very charismatic um and yeah. has like the the character is fun because it is like this marvel super fan this person who's obsessed with all of the heroes so it's kind of meta in that way but it's not like overly done where it's just like praising yeah. itself um <laughs> so it's it's been the character is fun and it has some potential i'm excited to see her in other stuff um but i'm just not sold completely on the actual story of where this particular show is going yet so we'll see okay but that's well, been be, that, be waiting to hear what you uh, think about it as it wraps up but that's been my uh my past two months in in film and tv but i know we want to get into some of these movies more specifically do you have a preference in where we start with some of the the ones that have come out in the last couple months i, I feel like we gotta start with the big gun okay being i can get behind that maverick the biggest movie in the world currently and other than minions of the year yes that's true um but this just crossed 1.1 billion like that's just like i can't even fathom that this movie made 1.1 billion i thought this movie would make like five or six hundred million tops um but the it's tom worldwide Cruise effect baby first yeah tom cruise biggest movie of his career first billion dollar hit um had a big opening just under the batman's opening it was i think upper 120s um in the domestically and uh I think it still has like a 99% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, which is like literally yep. I've never seen that before ever from any movie. 96% um, critic score and 99% audience with 50,000 plus yeah, ratings. Lee. That, that's nuts. Um, and people, I mean, the holds weekend to weekend, it's just been, it's been a phenomenon. Um, it, it, it's, it's been uh, highly praised across the board, worldwide, critics, audience, um, you know, other filmmakers, you name it. But we have yet to to like really weigh in or talk about it, at least on this platform. So um, yeah, let's just uh, get to it. I mean, I guess what else is there to say at this point, though, right, Zach? I mean, it's I mean, <laughs> it, it's it's fun because you were just talking about like the what people expected from this movie, and this came out Memorial Day weekend, end of May. So it's got the holiday weekend. It it came out on a Wednesday, I believe, to like really take advantage of the the yeah. holiday weekend but i was at the beach like with my friends for the weekend didn't get to see it until the following tuesday um so like had my weekend came back tuesday night at like 7 30 in raleigh went to uh, an imax screening and it was a packed house like 
people shoulder yeah. to shoulder, like not a seat open. And I'm like, I was honestly shocked when I pulled into the parking lot because it's like, I go to this movie theater all the time. It's never like too crowded. Like it was crowded for the Batman, but like that yeah. was the Batman. That was a superhero movie, like of the largest proportions. And then yeah. this movie I'm pulling in and it's packed on a Tuesday night at 7 30. <laughs> and I was just like, who else can do this besides Tom Cruise getting people, you know, it was, yeah. there, there were people that were like Navy veterans in there because they, they want to see it. There's like the kids with their dads, because it's like the dad's favorite movie. There were people my age, like our age going to see it because it's like this badass new movie. It was just yeah. such a, like a, a very diverse audience as well. It wasn't just like, you know, going to a Marvel movie on opening night and it's just your Marvel fans in there. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, and I went, yeah, I mean, I was there Thursday night, pretty much opening night. Um, and it was, yeah, packed. I've, I've, I've seen it three times now. I've seen it uh, three times and all, all uh, it was all in IMAX, all, all, you know, every time. Um, and always pretty full, even, yeah, more like a regular times of the week or of the day. Um, it was still like a fun, like good crowd and experience. And in IMAX, especially, I mean, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't gotten the opportunity, I think they've put it back in some IMAX theaters, um, mm -hmm. maybe some other like large format theaters, but it's uh it's definitely like a big screen experience and i feel like paramount and tom cruise are just like really patting themselves on the back and like reaping the benefits now of course financially of holding out for i mean this movie should have, was supposed to come out over two years ago it was really slated for like a may 2020 uh release um and ultimately i think this is one of the first films to really get delayed as well because they they knew okay pandemic's going on theaters are shutting down we're not going to streaming with this. We'll just wait, um, you know, whether that was six months, a year, and ultimately, you know, two years, they played the long game. They let it sit on the shelf. It, it was costing them money. Um, they had to rethink marketing and then do that a couple different times, but ultimately it's paid off absolutely in spades and they've made more than enough money back off this. Tom Cruise himself, I'm sure is, is getting like uh, over a hundred million, 10% um, from this. So financially it was just a great great choice and it, and it also was great to support movie theaters and to keep this out because just imagine the benefits that the theaters themselves have been reaping from this movie it's the biggest movie of 2022 outside of for american or hollywood films outside of spider-man no way home it's the biggest film since the start of the pandemic so it, it's just a, you know like i said across the board um a success and for good reason because the, the film is fantastic it's a very fun crowd-pleasing uh action you know kind of almost like an action drama like it, it, it has right it's it's that that was something that i wanted to get into next was like the comparison between top gun and top gun maverick the legacy sequel i know we've seen this in a couple other like we, of course for you blade runner and blade runner mm -hmm. 2049 being a legacy sequel you know you've got rocky and creed um yeah but this is one of the i don't know you may stick to your guns with with blade runner um but this is such a perfect legacy sequel because it is something that builds on its predecessor in every single way possible. You know, I, I had seen like the original Top Gun as a child, like with my dad. I hadn't seen it since then, probably. And then I watched it in the week, like leading up to the release of this movie, just as a refresher, yeah. um, which honestly, like I, I remembered like the main plot points. I remembered Goose. I remembered like everything that happened, but not like the details or how it was as a film. Um, yeah. So it was nice to revisit that, but to see this and, you know, the original Top Gun is, it's exciting, it's fun, it's tense, there's action, but it's never like pulse pounding action, especially looking back now, maybe it was at the time, like back when it first came out and you're, you're watching yeah. it in the theater then, but now it's like not anything revolutionary. <laughs> there's a, a, a romance, there's a love story, but it's not like super, you know, like it doesn't feel super deep or emotional. It's good, but it's not like, you know, next yeah. level. And then this movie comes around and it takes everything. It takes that, that like fraternal relationship between Rooster and Maverick. And it just drives that to the next level. It takes like the class element and the teaching and that relationship drives it to the next level. The action is just absolutely insane. All of the stunts, the filming, the cinematography, so good. The relationship with Jennifer Connelly's character next level and it's like has those nods to the original and the references and you know great balls of fire just everything that that ties into it 
And it just feels like something that adds so much to that original rather mm. than being like a cheap cash grab, which not that I necessarily expected this to be that at all, but it yeah. just really validated this decision to make the movie in the first place. Cause I know that Tom Cruise, like there, there there's the story of like how he literally just like called up Paramount once they figured, once someone like approached him with the, the story and yeah. he called up Paramount and was like, Hey guys, we're making a Top Gun sequel, just so you know. Um, and just like spoke it into existence. So the yeah. fact that like he knew it had to be perfect to come back and it definitely was perfect to, to justify doing that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And I think to answer maybe your question or like address what you were saying about the legacy sequel thing. Um, I mean, I still firmly believe Blade Runner 2049 is a better movie than, than Top Gun Maverick. Um, you know, Top Gun Maverick is, is excellent, like I said, but, uh, I do. I will say I agree with the the point of, and someone I think said this at the time that the reviews were starting to come out and and uh, it was kind of raised that you know is there a sequel uh, that has made the a jump this big between the the original uh, and and the next one, and I feel like to everything you just said no probably not because Top Gun the original it has there's a lot of nostalgia for that movie and it's a fun eighties movie it's a fun. Uh, kind of uh almost like campy like uh like fun it's not it is it's not even like a super patriotic movie either and i don't think this movie is either um you know honestly like i mean it's you all, definitely hear the it's military propaganda the, yeah I, I mean it's it's like so sanitized in so many ways like they don't ever discuss like who the, the faceless enemy, enemy yeah. <laughs> yeah like there's no it, it just they do it so like I feel like that honestly could be a criticism of the movie that it's like so just like blank and kind of like anti like conflict in that way. But also like I do think it goes against like some of the other criticisms like people saying that, oh, well, they're going after like this, that or the other thing when ultimately it is it isn't really about any of that. It's more about the relationships and, you know, what is what is, what do those mean? And like, how is that affecting like Maverick as a person, like as a man is like. Uh, a pilot so um you, we could definitely go into that and do a whole episode about that but i think from every every other standpoint the writing the the action the the sound and the editing and 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 the music is fantastic as well um Hans zimmer lady gaga um you know i think that it, it does up the ante in most every way if not every way so and the acting the performances are great as well tom cruise i think gives this is one of his best performances like i think it's just a very solid great strong leading man but he has like plenty of emotional moments as well and and some great humor but a lot of you know some fantastic dramatic moments so i i think there's a good balance there for him but also the supporting cast um you know none of, none of the other characters are like super deep or like have like a, the you know the most fleshed out backstory or anything like that and i think again that could be a criticism and why i would like say that oh this is a better legacy sequel than something like 2049 or maybe even creed or something uh like that but i think that uh you know we get some great stuff from miles teller as uh as um rooster the son of uh of um goose, goose. And then also we have, you know, Jennifer Connelly, as you mentioned, is great as a new character that's introduced, uh, you know, doing some good supporting stuff uh, with Maverick. And then uh, the return of Val Kilmer as Iceman, I thought was done so tastefully and mm. is one of the, the highlights of the movie for me. Um, and Glenn Powell, I think, would be the other shout out that a lot of people recognize. And, and he has Hang a fun Man. Hangman has a fun, fun uh, role in the movie, too. So. Um, and the, all of the other supporting, um, you know, pilots, it was a great crew. There's a lot of good uh, camaraderie and you could see the chemistry. So I thought it all worked. It was just a well-rounded, it's just a really well-rounded, fun, enjoyable, well-made movie. And that I think people just want to see that and they want to be entertained and they want to have fun and cheer and, and all these other things. But the fact, and people get that in some other movies, but I think the fact that it is not a superhero movie or it's not a star wars movie or just a big you know other disney product or something like that is a fresh like breath of fresh air and it is sad that we don't get more of these like we used to or that back in the day you would get movies like this all the time or like every summer or, you know what i mean um I, I just think that it's good and i think as far as blockbusters go this year the batman still number one for me uh, we'll get to that a little bit more later but um you know, the, the contrast between the Batman and Top Gun Maverick, I think is pretty stark as far as like the tone and the style and everything. Right. Uh, so, you know, I, I just think it's, uh, it's good that we're seeing this movie do well and, and uh, I enjoyed it and 
I'm sure it'll still be at the top of some people's list and maybe my list by the end of the year. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. Very, just, just a great time at the, at the theater. And I, I will say one thing as we get ready to shift over to the next one that with this being the legacy sequel, it very much it like felt the stakes were real. And I don't think they're necessarily like, I know that there have been speculation at this point that they may even do like another one now, but like, who knows what, who knows? Yeah. Um, but like at the time going into this, I don't think it was like, okay, we're bringing Top Gun back to, to reboot it and have more yeah. Top Gun movies and keep going. So it was like, this was like part two of a two part movie and that, you know, yeah, it could have like, I, I was watching this and I was like, is Maverick going to die? Is Rooster going to die? Like yeah. I expected something like, you had no idea what was going to happen versus in the the original, you know, it's like, okay, we obviously lose goose, but like, there's no way Tom Cruise, the main character is not going to die in this or something. Yeah. But, but with this one, it definitely did. The the stakes were high and, and I was watching it on the edge of my seat, like with bated breath because you didn't know what was going to happen. And they definitely have plenty of, of twists and turns in the, the last act that continue to play on that unknown. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely. This is this is one of my favorites of the year. We'll we'll get to that at the end here, but huge movie over the last couple months that we I'm glad we finally got to talk about it. But yeah, 100. Moving into the next one, I'll I'll take us down to to Graceland to talk about Elvis here. I literally just got out of the theater before we hopped on this podcast, catching up with that one. Uh, it's been out for a couple weeks now. Um, Austin Butler, which sidebar. Uh, some Dune news, Johnny. I know you're reveling in the 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 Dune <laughs> hive as they kick off production here. Um, but he is officially playing Fade Routh, right? Did I say that correctly? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so a little tease there. I don't think his character will be very similar to Elvis, but <laughs> still, a, a great to see him. He's inserting himself into the awards conversation already for this. So just further hype for dune part two as they get kicked off but elvis we are currently looking at a 78 percent on rotten tomatoes critics scored 94 percent audience score this is one that like i said it came out june 24th so it's been out for about two weeks at this point uh as we are recording and i just now got around to seeing it this was not necessarily something that was like high on my list to to check yeah. out i knew i'd watched at some point but um kind of mixed on great Gatsby as far as Boz Lerman goes um not great like biopics or hit or miss for me um yeah and I I mean I have like no strong connection to Elvis like I, I know his music obviously but I'm not like passionate about him it wasn't something that I was like eagerly anticipating yeah uh and I'm on top of all of that two hours and 39 minutes for something that you have those hesitations about is not necessarily like a warm <laughs> welcome it's not super super enticing so I finally today being July 4th had had the day off so I went and checked it out and I was very thrilled with what I saw this is this is far better than I could have anticipated um really really enjoyed it uh I mean I I not even like so much as the you know like Boz Lerman's flair and the the aerial camera and twisting and the stylization of everything um but I just really I thought Austin Butler was fantastic as Elvis, you know, getting lost in the character and bringing him to life. And I, I don't know, I was very struck by his tragic story. I, this is something that, again, I don't, I didn't have this connection to Elvis. I didn't know much about him whatsoever. I get, I probably learned m most of my Elvis information from Lilo and Stitch as she's teaching <laughs> Stitch about him. Um, so it was, it was very cool to see this story and it was fun to watch the big action not action, but the musical sequences that were so energetic, but then also to see him at these low moments and to, I, like, I, I didn't cry, I didn't shed a tear, but it was close, like when he's at the very end on the, the tarmac with Priscilla and they have the, the moment that, that that relationship was very powerful and strong to me and it, it, just, it just hit me. So I, I was very excited with this movie. Um, Tom Hanks, eh. He's, he's like, his character sucks. I hated him so much. Like yeah. that was the point he was, that, that means he did his job well. Um, but you know, the, the Colonel Butler or sorry, Colonel Parker, um, <laughs> just the, his like caricature almost. I don't know if he was playing like 
again, I don't know if that was accurate. If it was, then fantastic. Great job. But it just seemed like very <laughs> much like a evil movie villain caricature kind of thing. So yeah, he, he was, he was probably like my least favorite part of the movie outside, not just because like the character was evil yeah. in this movie, but you know, <laughs> I'll pass it over to you. I'm, I'm rambling at this point. What, no, what are your no, thoughts here? You're, that's a good point. I mean, you're totally right. Uh, I agree with you there. I do think that Tom Hanks, while not, I don't even know if I would call it a bad performance necessarily. I have heard though, to other people, I have not looked myself, um, but just looking at like clips or like old information, like footage from, uh, of Colonel Tom Parker. I don't know why I, like we continue to call him Colonel because he never was in the military, so, <laughs> but um, Tom Parker, he um, did not have the accent apparently uh, in real life. That was, that was definitely something when I was like, he said, oh, I'm just a boy from West Virginia or something. I was like, that is not how people in West Virginia speak. <laughs> and then they finally, so, there was like the reference that he fled from Holland or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I was like, that makes um, more sense. Yeah, that makes more sense. But even then, like his accent apparently in real life did not sound, and apparently, I'm not even sure if he had a, like a, a specific accent necessarily, but apparently it did not match up. So I'm not really sure what Tom Hanks or what they were going for there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I did not know how I felt about that. What I do know is that Austin Butler was phenomenal. Like I said, I, I tweeted about this after I saw the movie. Uh, but he yeah, is totally electric and uh, completely steals the show. He dominates the show. He is the show. I think with a lesser performance, a lesser actor in the lead role, that this movie just goes off the, the hinges probably. Because um, mm -hmm. Baz Luhrmann's style, I think, lends itself to this, uh, this person, uh, Elvis Presley, his flash and his... Uh, uh, charisma and things like that i think it lends itself well to that and, and his mu musical influences and whatnot um but i think you know to think about the fact that miles teller was up for this role that harry i was Styles about to say it. i i was pulling up the different the the top five people yeah. who auditioned and we were just talking about miles teller in a different movie than he could have been in this yeah i'm so glad that that did not happen agreed <laughs> like, agreed like like, I mean, I don't know if there was, I don't think there would have been a conflict necessarily. I don't think they filmed necessarily at the same time. Um, but just thinking about that Miles Teller could have been in Top Gun Maverick, and then he also could have been like leading this Elvis movie. Like, I don't think that would have been, it almost would have been maybe over like stimulation or like uh, overexposure for him. And also Harry Styles was someone that was named and mentioned pretty, pretty infamously as being up for it. And uh, I'm like Harry Styles and Baz Luhrmann said this, like he is a rock star, like he's a superstar without being a movie star without being an elvis so like i think that's there would have been very hard to distinguish like between those two like you had like you're watching the movie and you're seeing harry styles a world famous musician playing a world famous musician that is not harry styles like that would have just been a very strange um setup i think and i, I just think austin mm -hmm. butler who has had good roles or has been coming up for like a while now in small smaller performances i think this was just a ripe opportunity for him to really make his mark and like break out in a very um grand fashion and i think he is just again electric in this and i was already optimistic and looking forward to see him in dune uh, as you were tying it at the beginning of this but after seeing this like i just i cannot wait to see i mean denny villeneuve in particular is an as a director who i think gets nothing but exceptional work from pretty much all of his actors that he that he uh collaborates with and knowing that Austin Butler, who just gave this like phenomenal performance as Elvis uh, with Baz Luhrmann, just knowing that he is going to be working and playing a villain, uh, no less this time around with in the world of Dune and, and going, you know, toe to toe with uh, Timothy Chalamet's Paul Atreides. Um, I just I'm really excited to see what they do with that. And I think he'll thrive in that. And uh, I, I think this movie is worth watching for him alone. I think if you don't enjoy necessarily any of the other elements, if the music's maybe too much for you, which I liked, or the editing is just too flashy or the style is too overwhelming, which again, I liked for the most part. Um, I think that you will still enjoy or get a kick out of it just for, by watching how he inhabits Elvis. And uh, he sings early on in uh, um, some of the earlier songs when he's younger Elvis, he does actually perform those and sings that does the vocals in their entirety, which I thought was very impressive. I thought he did a great job with those um and then later on he, it, it's more of like a blend or like largely like elvis's vocals so 
but even then still has a great stage presence, great, great uh, physicality and whatnot. So um, yeah, Elvis, not, not like maybe like a great movie, I would say. Um, but I think it is good and I think it is enjoyable and maybe probably honestly in what looks like it's going to be a weaker summer, I think could be one of the highlights. Yeah, I agree with you there. I, I gave it a four stars. I was, I was very pleased with, um, with everything about it. I know that some of it was still, uh, a, a bit slower that that runtime did come into effect for me. Yeah. Um, it kind of like lulled maybe in like, at like the two thirds mark a yeah. little bit, um, because the, the beginning was interesting as we were kind of getting into it all. Um, and then I definitely checked my, I checked my watch and I saw that we still had an hour left. Um, because I was just <laughs> curious. Like, it wasn't like, a, oh, this needs like, I'm ready for this to be over. I was just curious at like, at how far along we were. Um, yeah. So, but then it, it picked back up in the, the final act. So there was just like a slight lull in the middle. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. I was very, I don't know if I'm, biased because of my surprise about it but it was it was very it was very fun for me and I listened to Elvis on the way home from the movie theater um and I'm also diving into the Wikipedia family tree of Elvis and did you know that Riley Kyo Riley I don't know how to say her last name the the, the actress that she is Elvis's granddaughter now that that's her mother is Lisa Marie Presley Crazy. Yes, I did know. I did know that. Yeah, no, she's a she's a full blown uh, nepotism baby. Yeah, <laughs> which is, uh, I mean, I guess like that is shocking though. Like if you don't know that, you're like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> why? But she's, I knew, I mean, she's a talented. I knew there was some connection because I remember, like, I knew there was some like Michael Jackson connection, and so then I was like diving through, and that yeah. Lisa Marie was married briefly married to Michael Jackson and Nicolas Cage. So. Yep. Just yeah, well, yeah, the, the Nicholas Cage here. is her, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's nuts. Crazy. God damn, what a crazy connection of, of uh, very famous people. Um, I know, just, that's, it's, that's weird. Good. I guess, I know Elvis was already dead and gone, but that, that would be so weird if Michael Jackson was his son-in-law. Like, I guess he technically right? still yeah. was, but I don't know, just, just celebrities are weird. <laughs> they are, they're a whole different breed. Um let, let's well, with, with that being said let's let's go into something a little bit maybe uh, a little bit darker maybe a little bit more sinister with our next uh film minions here. um <laughs> wouldn't you wouldn't you like that the rise um, of Groot. no i freaking hate the minions i would never even if, even for this like meme purposes of people going in their suits in groups of hundreds to watch the minions <laughs> the i would i'd like i have you have you seen these on tiktok of, yeah like, the yeah, people yeah. that are like mosh pitting at the front of minions while there's probably like a poor like father and his <laughs> four-year-old just trying to watch an 11 a.m screening but <laughs> no i would still i i still cringe at the regal like roller coaster that is currently taken over by the minions when the movie well, starts so. you know what zach now that you you've changed my mind now that we're now we're talking about minions i want to talk about another animated movie okay that is uh no minions is lighting up the box office maybe due in part to these meme groups that are going in in uh in hordes to watch the movie as a as a joke watch it ironically um but i think there's a uh, an anime movie that i i would not watch minions you're right i would not watch despicable me um either but i did go ahead and see uh pixar's lightyear the new joint from uh, our folks over there at Pixar and Disney uh, that came out earlier in June. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was pleasantly surprised, I would say, overall with this movie. Um, Agreed. It was, not, it was not exceptional. It was not one of Pixar's best by any stretch. But I went in, you know, with tempered expectations because I felt like, oh, God, this could be a bit of a cash grab. I don't know what they're doing with this exactly. Um, but by the end of it, I was like, okay, that was fun. I'd watch, I would watch more of Lightyear. I would watch a, I would watch a sequel. I would watch more of these, these characters, Agreed. what else they could come up with. And, uh, and so, yeah, I feel like overall it's been kind of, I don't know why this has been like such a controversial, like, I feel like there's a bunch of d- different, like, uh, annoying or ridiculous reasons for it. Um, but I, I really just felt like it was so inoffensive for the most part, like just all around. Um, and I think you feel pretty similarly, I would say. Yeah, this was another one that uh, I was late to the party on. I say not as late as, I guess, Elvis, but 
it, it came out. I was doing something over the weekend and then didn't get around to it until Sunday evening. Um, but yes, went in again, similar to Elvis. Maybe I'm just starting to go into movies with lower expectations, so I'm enjoying <laughs> it better. But I like, never. I, I love the Toy Story movies. Never have been like a huge like Buzz Lightyear specifically fan. So. Right. I, I was like, yeah, I'll see it. Of course, it's Disney, it's Pixar. Like, I'm not going to not see it. But um, was very pleased with it. I gave it a solid three and a half stars. Thought it was a lot of fun. And something that was very, like, ju- again, going back to Top Gun, like, justified. It didn't feel like it was just, like, a hastily put together cash grab. Um, but that this was something that expanded on the character and the world. And I know we had had the... Like we had heard from the start that this was not like a Buzz Lightyear sequel. This was like, and it says it straight off the top, that this is the movie that Andy saw. Like this is in the world of Toy Story. It's not just like another movie about the toy. So I thought that was a cool spin. And I could totally see how putting myself in Andy's shoes as a child by going to see that movie, that I could see why you like rush to the store and buy the toy. And like why you, that is his Star Wars basically of like, seeing this movie happen um but i'm totally with you on the like where it falls it was i again i said solid three and a half stars and then i went on letterbox to add it to my pixar movies ranked um and i was like okay it's not better than that one not better than that one and it's right now it's at 16 out of the 21 pixar movies i've not seen all of them so of my 21 um it's 16 which puts it like towards the bottom but it was still a a good time very enjoyable had some cool sci-fi space stuff um yeah honestly had some parallels to top gun as he's like continuing to push himself in this this like new and not not a space vehicle but it it reminded me of the the very opening scene of top gun black star he's he's getting his his 10 g's or whatever mock 10 yeah, no, I totally, uh, I, I hear that. Yeah, Top Gun comparisons for sure in some regards. Um, but yeah, it was it was just not a disaster, like dumb as I thought like it could be or as uninspired as I thought it could be. I just think it was cool to see, like the animation, of course, is like gorgeous. Like it's pretty much perfect. Mm-hmm. I don't think- We anyone... don't even talk about that anymore when we're talking yeah, about- Yeah, it just, it goes without saying, but I will highlight it for the purposes of uh, saying what is good about this movie. It is a very- good looking movie and it's cool to see a pixar like a disney movie that takes inspiration from like draws parallels to like ridley scott and like his alien movies or uh you know 2001 a space odyssey and with just the designs of the ships and like the textures and like the aesthetics i thought that was really neat to see it was just something different that we haven't really seen before and i remember when they announced this film um back at uh, like it was disney uh like investors day or whatever a few years ago Mm-hmm. Uh, they were like, this is going to be Pixar's first sci- like sci-fi film. And I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. And then of course it ended up being a light year movie. And I was like, okay, like, I guess we'll see what happens. Um, and I feel like the biggest thing with this is that like the story, I feel like the story could be divisive, like the way it goes and like the, the, what it chooses to tell and how it tells it could be people like, oh, well, why would you do that when you could have done like a million other things or you know, why, why did you limit yourself to this or go this way? And I just thought, I didn't really think about like the, all the alternatives, like possibilities necessarily uh, going into it. I went into it like fairly blind. Like I didn't read reviews or like have a very good idea of what the story was actually about. Um, so I was actually pleasantly surprised, like taken by surprise with the direction they went. And I thought that was like, Oh, cool. Like that is interesting. Like, I wonder what this movie is going to be like, you know, now or overall, how I'm going to feel at the end. And by the time I got there, I was like, okay, that was actually like a pretty neat, it was almost like I haven't watched that much Star Trek. Like I haven't really watched Star Trek outside of like the newer films for the most part, but I do know about it and have read about it and whatnot. Um, And it almost seemed like, felt like it could have been like something out of like a Star Trek, like episode or like a movie, like just the way it's done uh, with some of the elements, like the narrative elements and and character kind of tropes or like story tropes. Um, Which again, I feel like for kids watching for the first time, if they're not familiar with all these other older, like more mature properties necessarily, I think they're, they are going to enjoy it and get a kick out of it. Like Andy would have like in the world mm-hmm. of, of toy story. So I was fine with that. I, I laughed, I smiled. I was on my, on the edge of my seat for certain parts. So I wasn't really sure what was going to happen or how they were going to do it. And I was also surprised, like I said, at some of the, the decisions they made or like 
uh, routes the story went. So that was also like when I can be surprised and it's not like terribly predictable. Um, and you know, some of these other like kids movies are, then I, I'm like, okay, I can, I can go with that. So um, yeah, I would, you know, I, I think kids would especially enjoy it. I think some adults obviously going to enjoy it more than others, but um, I, I really, I think you would really be hard pressed to like hate this movie or like just think it's the worst thing. I think people that do, I think like, that's just, I, I, I'm the first one to, to act like that or like go and like want to like kind of trash something. Cause I feel like it's quote lazy or like uninspired. I just feel like this was not like the, the worst thing or like not mm-hmm. on that level by any means. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. Um, one thing that again, it was, it would have been easy for this to be that way to fall into those traps that we've seen from some like Disney properties where it is kind of like just plug and play with like the same elements, but recycle yeah. the same story. Um, and one of the things that I was kind of dreading almost going in was the character of socks, the emotional support cat. And it, that being like the, okay, this is obviously what they're doing to sell merch. They're, this is going to be the toy that kids want to buy. But I really like, I don't know if you felt the same way. I thought that that was like one of the funniest characters, like the recurring lines from socks. Yeah. It was genuinely funny. And that had me laughing in the theater. Um, so that was, that was a pleasant surprise to see that it had, had good humor throughout uh, to go along with like the exciting action. So yeah, I, totally. I was, I was pleased. Totally. Lovely. Shall we take a darker turn here? This is the last one of the the past two months that I necessarily want to dive in. I don't know if there's something that that we're missing here. Um, And it's not Jurassic World Dominion. We're going to skip over that one. I will say it it is it is as bad as you have heard, folks. Um, (laughs) Unfortunately, I would say better than Jurassic World whatever that last one fallen kingdom whatever that one was um oh, but God. not not by much uh still was was a, a big wolf for me but this Ooh. movie this next one that we're going to talk about is the black phone which you know i was it, it, it was it was good it was good it, well it didn't blow me away yeah but it was it was good it was entertaining it was a a nice little horror horror thriller that had some good jumps in it but you know probably not going to be thinking about it for much longer outside of this podcast I don't know that's not really selling it very hard off the bat (laughs) here but it was it was fun I I don't know I don't I was not expecting a masterpiece or anything beyond like a three star three and a half star um but it was a cool blend of like you know your sort of your kidnapped child but then also the supernatural elements here at work as well yeah no i i am in the same boat with you i think i might have liked it or like rated a little bit higher than you did uh, a little bit more but uh i think i sentiment is mostly the same it was a good we went opening not opening night but like friday night um like a later show and it was like pretty busy uh, like good energy and folks were like into it and so that was fun, you know, the jump scares getting everyone freaked out and and some of the there's some a good amount of humor in this movie as well, especially like the way they they play with like the kid characters I thought was mm-hmm. done well. Um, and so that there was good laughs and like good energy with that child actors were both impressive I, and when I say both I mean the siblings that are kind of the central uh, characters mm-hmm. in the film um, was impressed with them and they did well Ethan Hawke of course is creepy and, and scary and uh, Honestly, I almost wish he was in it more um, because he is more of a peripheral character that's just kind of, he, he, he's the cog that keeps the story of the main character like in motion and like gets him mm-hmm. to where he's going to go ultimately. Um, and so I thought that was, uh, that was interesting. And it, it's, yeah, it's not like the most uh, riveting or like most unpredictable or like shocking, scary, exciting, like horror thriller that you could want to get. Um, but I, yeah, I, I thought it was good. I thought it was a solid, uh, like a three and a half, I think out of five is what I gave it. Um, does its thing. Um, uh, but it is, it's a b- pretty brisk watch as well. Um, but it's enjoyable. And at the end, I, I mean, people were like cheering and like clapping, like during the climax of this movie. Okay, guys, um, come on. 
So I was like, okay, like people are really digging this uh, more than I did. But like I said, I would still, I say it's like something you watch once you get some thrills or get like a little bit of enjoyment out of it. And then I probably won't ever watch it or like really think about it again, but that's fine. I mean, those are those kinds of movies. It's not mediocre. It's not poorly made, um, but it's, it's just, it's just kind of more like base level kind of good, like solid, like horror entry. Yeah. I mean, it was your, it was your Blumhouse horror movie. It's your Blumhouse, yeah. And that's why I don't watch a lot of the Blumhouse movies, like, honestly, because I know the ones that I do, like, remember the most or, like, enjoy the most. I mean, Get Out, of course, iconic. Uh, Whiplash, which is not even a horror movie, but it's technically Blumhouse. Yeah. Um, and then, like, the horror movies, like, of course, like, Insidious. And I think Sinister is one of the ones that's in there. Like, the con- are the Conjuring movies Insidious? No. Blumhouse, I mean. Um, but, like, those are the ones that I think about the most. Or, like, I enjoy, like, you know the most fondly um but this is like this will not be like upper echelon or like remembered like as most you know as as well as those i think are like the halloween movies i guess would also be considered like the newer ones would be considered up there um yeah but it was fine i will say real quick i don't know if you were going to mention anything else about black phone really um but i i did also see crimes of the future uh Mm. you know when that came out i think it was early i've not seen that one Early June, uh, premiered at Cannes, and I did get to go ahead and see it, saw it in theaters. Uh, and it was also like a three and a half. It was not as good as I had hoped it would be, or as good as I had like wanted it to be necessarily. Um, but it was a solid kind of, it's a different type. If, if you're familiar with David Cronenberg, or if you're not familiar, I guess I'll say, he's like, you know, he's into like body horror, and he's into like futuristic dystopian, like, societies and kind of like how do we get there and like what does that mean and like making parallels to to today's times and uh it, this one like does some of that and it does like that is kind of interesting the way they approach that um i would say like the characters are like a little bit more flat uh, with the exception of like kristen stewart's character who is she's like it's hilarious but like in a in like an off kilter sort of way like she's not like necessarily i don't even know what she's doing necessarily but it's it's an enjoyable performance and it it bounces well off of like vigo mortensen's character in particular um so that was fun and like got some like good laughs out of me and it is like almost like a dark comedy and his and his movies are like that most of the time um and there's some interesting imagery and it's not as i will say this as well even though he's known for body horror like this did not like bother me as much as some of his other films are like body horror films in general like it didn't like really get under my skin or like make me feel like faint or like anything. so it wasn't like titan titan like genuinely i thought i was gonna fight, like die like trying to watch that movie <laughs> like the first 30 minutes of titan like i was i had to leave and go get water and come back like i genuinely thought i wasn't gonna make it so definitely definitely not on that level i mean everyone's different as far as like their tolerance for that but uh i think if you get a chance to see it, if you like cronenberg or if you are looking for some different like horror concepts or like off kilter um stuff like that i'd give it a shot uh if you can see it in theaters you know why not go go support it on the big screen but otherwise maybe like catch it you know rent it or see it on streaming when it gets there um it's not like great like i said but it's not like totally like you know forgettable i wouldn't just you know say not to watch it or to avoid it by any means well there you have it the last two months in review here we promise we'll be better we'll try our best to be better moving forward We'll at least try and get to you next week for Thor. But before we wrap up here, let's break down, not necessarily break down, let's just discuss the top five of the year so far. We are in July, which means we are halfway through 2022. So before we make it all the way to the end of the year and hit you with our year-end lists, let's check in where things stand as of now. We've talked about quite a few of mine already on this podcast. Mm. Uh, Top five. I will, you know, no spoilers here. I don't want to spoil my year end list. So I'm just going to read them in a general order, not in a one through five order. So we've got, we've got Elvis that we just talked about here. We've got Scream, which really stuck with me from the the very start of the year. Uh, The fifth Scream movie, the reboot, Top Gun Maverick, which again, we've already discussed here, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and The Batman. I know we've talked about both of those previously, but two really solid movies that have kind of, that came out earlier in the year and have really held down those top spots on my list. Um, And I don't see that changing much, but we've obviously got a whole 
slew of movies coming out the rest of the summer and awards season once we get into the fall. So who knows what will happen. But a solid group of five for me, uh, including an addition from today being Elvis. So yeah, absolutely. Really, really good group there. Yeah, uh, I would say speaking like about a top five, uh, I suppose, um, just watched uh, over the last week or, or weekend, I watched RRR uh, on Netflix. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about this on Twitter, social media. If you haven't seen it yet um, and you have Netflix, you know, you're in the US, maybe you don't watch Indian films like foreign language films and non-English language films that often or um you know, you hear or like have seen Bollywood films in the past. Again, you know, I'm not sure if, the, if RRR is technically like if the, most people would file it under like Bollywood, but it is a fun, um, action packed. Um, uh, there's romance. There's, there's, like I said, there's like comedy. There's like a brotherly bond in this movie. Um, not too dissimilar to something like you would see in Top Gun Maverick, for example. Uh, but it, it's just a really fun, uh, interesting take on like a like a legend it's almost like a a legendary like retelling like it's a historical epic in that kind of way um and so i i enjoyed it it is long it is like a three hour like it's a proper epic it's almost three hours long um about the same runtime as like the batman for example but i think if, if you want something different and if you want something you want to branch out a little bit i definitely uh say you should give it a shot and uh and then also on speaking about streaming titles Cha Cha Real Smooth on Apple TV Plus. This one at Sundance this year won the top prize. And uh, I really like this one as well. It was, again, an enjoyable watch at home. Um, funny, uh, heartwarming. It is almost like sickly sweet, just how sweet some of the scenes are, like how, how the story kind of progresses or like turns out. But it is, it is uh, you know, a pleasant watch. It's an easy kind of breezy sort of watch. And uh, the performances are really good. Dakota Johnson, a lot of people have been praising her, saying she should get awards attention. Um, Cooper Rafe. Cooper Rafe is like a wonderkin. Uh, he's like 26, I think, maybe, or maybe 27 at this point. Um, a little bit older than me, I believe. But uh, he is. He wrote this. He directed it. He stars in it. Um, it's his second feature that he already has under his belt, starring, writing, and directing. Uh, and he won at Sundance and sold it to Apple. And, uh, and, and uh, he's... Not, I mean, he's not like out here directing Citizen Kane or anything, but he is an impressive talent and I'm looking forward to seeing what he does next. Um, and then my top three, I'd say these three films and we've discussed all of them before, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but um, these three, I think are head and shoulders, like the clear three for me this year, um, I think uh, so far. And I'd say they're in the order of Top Gun Maverick. Again, really liked it, loved the action, loved the story. Um, just a really fun theater experience. And then everything everywhere all at once. Beautiful, so fun, so inventive, heartwarming, to, you know, get, gets me a tear up uh, the two times I saw it in theaters. And uh, super funny as well and great action. And, and it's just unlike anything else you'll probably see this year. Um, and then uh, The Batman. I mean, The Batman for me is already one of my all-time favorite movies. I'm, again, a total mark for Batman. Grew up with Batman, Dark Knight one of my favorite movies ever. Um, but this is already up in that upper echelon for me. I saw it seven times in theaters, uh, ended up happening. That's my new record. Um, and I have, you know, I have it on 4k, um, have seen it once already and, and just really enjoy that film and the, the new version, uh, of Batman on screen that Matt Reeves and, and Robert Pattinson have kind of cooked up. So, um, that'll still be very close, if not at the top by the end of the year, I would imagine. But uh, all these others, I think, will shift. I think there's a lot of good stuff to come. And like I said at the beginning of the show, it's been just a really solid, I feel like, first almost like full strength year since 2019, essentially. Because um, mm -hmm. 2020, everything, of course, as we know, went off the rails. Um, and we're slowly uh, kind of just getting back on uh, on track now. So um, really, uh, really pleased with things so far. And there's other films, Elvis, as you mentioned. Um, I, I liked, uh, you know, light year is that we already talked about. I liked, um, and, and there's are, there are others of course. So it, you know, crimes of the future. So if you haven't like found something you really loved or really like so far this year, I'd say keep looking. Cause there's definitely something, whether it's on streaming or in theaters, um, you know, keep, keep your eyes peeled and, and, you know, there's more to, to come this week with Thor and then later this month with Nope and, and all sorts of stuff later on. Well, let me ask you here, as we wrap up, before we hit that sweet, sweet outro, the one movie, give me one for the next six months that 
is the top of your list for what you're looking forward to at Ooh. the end of 2022? That's a great question. I'm going to have to go with Damien Chazelle's Babylon uh, for the simple fact that Damien Chazelle, he's like three for three, like mm-hmm. as far as his major features, five out of fives across the board for me, Whiplash, Law La Land, First Man, and everything I've heard and seen so far um, with Babylon, cast, crew, uh, test screenings, that sort of thing. It's, it's going to be special, I think, and I think it's just going to add to his... Uh, his legacy so far. So I'm very excited, very much looking forward to that. Hi, buy, buy the stock now while you can. That is certainly on my list as well. Uh, but I am going, anyone who knows me knows of my love of Booksmart, of my devotion to oh, Olivia Wilde. Nice. So I'm going, don't worry, darling. I know it's closer than we're going to be getting with Babylon, but don't worry, darling, is September 23rd, which I looked yeah. it up while we were recording. That's the same day that the Avatar re-release happens. So mark your calendar for a, a double header there. But I will be, <laughs> don't worry, darling. So excited to see what's next from Olivia Wilde. Um, so different from Booksmart uh, as a movie. So I'm excited to, to see how she kind of transforms as a director with the second step. We've got Harry Styles. We've got Florence Pugh. I mean, star-studded cast, Chris Pine, Olivia Wilde as well, Gemma Chan. But very excited for this it has that sort of almost jordan peele-esque like kind of something is off but we've got to wait and figure out what it is you know that there's (laughs) there's some twist here um but super 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 excited for don't worry darling great choice there you have it the last six months what's coming the next six months we are back so sorry for the delay hope you enjoyed this episode thank you so much for sticking with us and tuning in yeah 100 great to be back uh thank you as always for supporting listening watching sharing uh you know stay tuned on social media as we continue to get fired back up getting some more podcast episodes coming your way follow on twitter like us you know on facebook follow us on instagram as well keep up with our giveaways uh the interview zach has been cranking out doing some great work there which you can also find on youtube if you go ahead and subscribe on that platform as well. And all those accounts can be found at Inside Film Room. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter, The Rewind, so you can get everything sent straight to your inbox. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio, wherever you can find a podcast. We are there. And come back next week as we break down the next entry in the MCU with Thor Love and Thunder. We will see you then.